we're moving on from the metals. And now time to get into the non-metal native elements. Our first mineral to look at will be capital A, and it is diamond. And to inspire us will be this beautiful image of two octahedrons from GAA showing diamond in pure carbon. In the textbook, you can see that this is 346 to 350. And there have been dozens and dozens of historical books written about the significance of diamond. There's been hundreds of scientific papers. Diamond fascinates us. And it has as a society since 400 BC, where the first reports are of um, diamonds in India and in Europe and Alexander the Great. Today, it's a multi-billion um, dollar industry per year. 30 tons of diamonds are mined for both gem and industry, and it's about a 50-50 split between the two. We know about diamonds because of this, right? De Beers says a diamond is forever. And we've also maybe heard about it in movies like this where um, blood diamonds have been explored. Di blood diamond means a conflict diamond, and these are diamonds that were used to support warlords much of them in, in Africa, and that's been largely eliminated today by different um, treaties that United Nations have kind of put together. But at one time in the 80s, about 20% of all diamonds were blood diamonds. And so there were millions of deaths um, and, and, and slaveries and rapes uh, upon diamonds. But anyways, that, that's part of the cultural significance of diamond. Here we're to talk about mineralogy. And so let's get started on that with number one, and we'll talk about diamond chemistry. Now, I did say that diamond is pure carbon, and that's actually not entirely true, right? Uh, it should be carbon, and it is carbon that is covalently bonded, covalently bonded with a very dense structure. Dense structure. And what ends up happening is the covalent bonds are in the form of a tetrahedron, a shape you've learned about probably a lot, in crystallography. But so what you see is with every one diamond, it's bonded to one, two, three, four separate. So in your notes, maybe you should draw just part of this where we have a central one that is bonded to one, two, three, four others. And that shows how the dense covalent structure works, which separates diamond, which is carbon, from graphite, which is carbon, right? And the structure is different at the atomic level, making them different minerals. So it's also the same structure as coal, but that would even be a, a more open network than this. Now, it's not necessarily pure carbon, right? There was a lecture about this earlier when, we were, when I was introducing to the class the idea of defects, and trace impurities are certainly, impo are certainly possible in diamond. Impurities are possible. And when there are these trace impurities, you can get different colors, right? So something like uh, nitrogen at the 100 ppm kind of level will give your diamond a yellow color, whereas boron at the less than 1 ppm level will give a blue. So I did snag a picture. There's not really maybe not much space for this right here. But if we were to look at all the different shades and colors of diamonds, we can think about them in terms of their trace impurities, right? So we would label the blue ones here as due to boron. Uh, these yellows are due to nitrogen. What other? So the pinks, though, and the greens, those are due to defects. And the browns, those are due to structural defects. So we could also say that um, imperfections are possible in the form of defects, right? Where one of these little carbons is replaced by a nitrogen or a boron. Right? That's what I want you to be picturing. Time for a little bit of mineralogy now. So we'll go to the mineralogy of diamond. And I guess the most important thing about that is that it is in the isometric system. Okay, my pen's glitching out of it. There we go, catching back up. Isometric system. Stop glitching. And it tends to form octahedrons. When diamond grows slowly and controlled, it forms octahedron. And we're going to think of this as the normal crystal form. But if you do grow faster, 
you can make cubes. This is from like fast growth. And then you can also make dodecahedrons. Dodecahedrons of diamond. But these are by Resorb. Let me put a picture up of this real quick, and then we'll get to the idea. All right, so these are our different um, potential crystal forms of diamond. But I mentioned resorption. Let's, let me walk you through a little bit of absorption. These are images coming from a book called Tappert and Tappert, mostly, and others are maybe coming from GIA. Those are my two best sources for diamond science. But uh, let's see. What ends up happening with resorption is you can get the initial, so initial octahedron is what grows most of the time. But do you see how the corners and the edges will start to preferentially resorb as you're going to the Earth's surface? This isn't happening happening probably, well, it can't, well, let's, what am I trying to say? Resorption. This occurs in mantle or transit to Earth's surface. Basically, when the diamond leaves its zone of thermodynamic equilibrium, it starts to break down, right? That's what resorption means. And what it will start to do is preferentially get rid of the corners, edges, and it can also grow these little features here, which are called trigons. I'm gonna label this. These little features, these little upside down triangles, they're called trigons, and they are evidence for resorption. So maybe what you could do in your notes so you could draw diamond. Here's an octahedron of a diamond. Something like this. And we're starting to resorb that diamond, and we'll put in some little trigons. The trigons are up are triangles that point to the middle of the diamond. And they're evidence for resorption. And it's very, very common to see diamonds with resorption or resorption that makes them even turn into uh, dodecahedrons. That's what these two things are right here. These are both dodecahedrons. Okay, now the next thing about the mineralogy is that it has a hardness of 10. So hardness equals 10. It's the hardest substance on Mohs hardness scale and on Earth for that matter. But, but, is a big but, it is brittle. And it will break with a cleavage. And the cleavage is considered a, a perfect octahedral cleavage. So let's say that. Perfect octa... Man, I don't know why it, my pen glitches out sometimes. Perfect octahedral cleavage. And what that'll look like is if you were to draw... Maybe you should do that right now. If you were to draw a nice octahedron like this, well, you can get a cleavage plane that goes like this along the one 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 and so you could have that whole face just break off like that that's the direction of an octahedral cleavage if we were to label that we would say there's our cleavage direction our other physical property that we've been talking about for each mineral is specific gravity for diamond it's 3.52 and this is kind of interesting because graphite is only a 2.2 so just put this in. Graphite is 2.2. And the reason why it's so different is because of that, that tight tetrahedral, dense covalent bonding in the structure. One of the things that's really important about that 3.52 specific gravity is our geologic occurrence. Because it is more dense, more dense than quartz and feldspar and other really important rock forming minerals, it allows it to form placer deposits, right, or alluvial deposits. So three, more dense than quartz, feldspar, etc., allowing us to produce the number one geologic occurrence, geologic occurrence, number one is the placer deposit. Synonym for placer is alluvial, it means waterborne, and what ends up happening is that the high specific gravity concentrates diamond by water action. Concentrates, ooh, I like this. I added another word here. Long lived. That's because of its hardness. 
doesn't erode quickly in, in, in a river system. Long lived diamond um, eroding from kimberlites. Well, there's a word I haven't introduced yet. But this placer alluvial type of geologic occurrence could also be known as a secondary type deposit. It is being eroded from the primary material and put into a stream system. Well, our next little arrow is going to be primary. Before we get to that, why don't I just throw in a picture showing the placer environment where primary source is being eroded down into streams where it gets concentrated usually in like the, the coarser grained conglomerates at the bottom of a river deposit or in a paleo alluvial deposit that's ancient even though there's no river there today and when we're if we were to look at a diamond from this environment we would start to see abrasion um, commonly taking off some of those octahedral points and edges and rounding it out from all the impacts of grain on grain. But the, the, the primary geologic occurrence, let's say this, let's do this, let's call it primary. There's a couple different things here we want to introduce. But the primary formation of diamonds that occurs in the mantle from carbon rich fluids. So we're gonna say this, we're gonna say diamonds crystallize. Crystallize from carbon rich fluids in the mantle and it's actually fairly deep in the mantle like a hundred kilometers down to 600 kilometers deep that is way down there and so that's going to introduce a problem to us about how do we get diamonds from the mantle up to their surface well kimberlite's going to be the answer to that and that's where we're heading right now but if we think about the mantle in terms of uh, temperature and depth or temperature and pressure space there is this um, phase transition where at shallower conditions above this dashed line graphite is the stable form of carbon so if you were to kind of draw this in, you could draw something like this, and you've got temperature, and you've got pressure, put in a dashed line, and we have um, stability. This whole graph is called stability of carbon in Earth. All right, that's why we'd label this. And below this line, diamond is stable, but above is graphite. Now these lines here, one, two, and three, those are called geotherms. A geotherm. And a geotherm describes how temperature changes with depth as you go deeper in the earth. And what it tells us is that in the tectonic environments where there's oceanic crust or oceanic lithosphere, as you go deeper, it gets hot really fast and you never enter into the diamond field. In continental lithosphere, in many environments that are called, they're called non-cratonic, so they don't have this deep keel. These are like the outsides of continents. Craton means like the inside of continent. Anyways, I'll put that definition down in a second. But in many places on the continents, it also, it gets too hot, too fast, and so you never can get deep enough, cold enough to make diamonds. But there are these special places inside continents called cratons that go deep and they stay fairly cold, allowing you to get into the diamond stability field. So I'm going to add a word here. I'm going to add a word called craton. Maybe you've learned this earlier in your career. It's, it's maybe somewhat basic. But this is old, stable, continental crust. This is the material at the, at the very insides of continents. Okay, so what we have to do is we have to somehow have an environment that is cold and deep in order to get diamonds to stabilize. That happens in cratons. Then we have to get that material to the Earth's surface, right? You're starting to see why diamonds are special now, because it's requiring quite a few steps, right? So if we were to look across the world, where diamonds form, and the, and the, uh, you can see that they only occur in these um, pink and purple domains. These are called cratons, right? So they're the interior, really thick parts of cratons, and they are associated with primary diamond deposits. In other places, like Florida, does not have thick and deep craton. It doesn't have diamonds. So that's just kind of establishing why our geotherm, or I guess the effect 
of the geotherm. So then the last bit we have to talk about is how we can actually get the material to the surface, and that is through kimberlites. Kimber, spell this right, kimber light is a special type of magma, and it's a magma that's very low in silica and very high in H2O and CO2. Low SiO2 and high CO2 and H2O magma from the mantle. Magma from mantle. It is the freight train that carries diamonds to the Earth's surface because kimberlites erupt explosively and they travel from the deep mantle. And as they travel so quickly from the deep mantle, they rip off chunks of the mantle wall rock, which are called xenoliths. So we're going to say here that um, kimberlites uh, travel from mantle. You could also say through mantle, and they rip, or say they rip chunks, chunks of mantle off. That mantle may host diamonds. It may not host diamonds diamonds, but they may host diamonds, and those would be the kimberlites that would be the very valuable deposits. And then, so as it's ripping its way towards your surface, carrying xenoliths, we should put that word here, that's a word from intro that you should know, right, foreign rock bodies, xenoliths, it'll also then erupt explosively at the Earth's surface. So we'll say this as well about kimberlites, kimberlites erupt explosively at surface making a crater called a diatreme making a crater called a diatreme and what a diatreme is is it kind of looks like a carrot or a funnel and it's just from this really explosive eruption of magma from the Earth's mantle. So if we were to look closely, you could maybe draw a diatreme here. Basically, you've, we have a volcanic crater that's funnel-shaped. And there's some deposits at the Earth's surface of ejecta. But material shoots out here and rains down to form the pyroclastic beds. Other material shoots up and then falls down in and just kind of starts mixing all together. And so what this is, is a very mixed, um, it's a very mixed heterogeneous rock full of all sorts of magma chunks and xenoliths and maybe diamonds. And so here over on, on the side is a picture of what that mixed material might look like inside of a kimberlite. You can see big chunks of like things, here's some big fragments, and, and maybe in here also there's going to be a couple small little diamonds, but not very much. There's been about 6,000 kimberlite eruptions on Earth, a thousand of them have borne diamonds, and there's only about 20 of them that are being mined today. So I guess the last picture I want to show you today is just a, an example of one of these kimberlites that's been mined because it bears diamonds. This is called the Akati Field, which is in northern Canada. And basically what ended up happening is that every, they got discovered because the glaciers preferentially eroded the softer kimberlite material from the hard host rock around it, making these lakes. And they recognized that there's a lot of, well, there's a lot of lakes out here, but some of those lakes are actually kimberlites. And so they dig down into the kimberlite, pulling out kimberlitic material and the diamonds in them. Each one of these costs around $700 million to prepare and excavate, but each one is also probably hosting around 25 years worth of mining of about $8 billion worth of diamonds. I love looking at this picture because you can imagine how this diatreme root zone connects down deeper. And at some point you go too deep and the mining operation becomes uneconomic, but this must continue all the way down deep into the Earth's mantle. Phenomenal geology.